Hey racers and welcome to another live stream. Um, wait for a few of you guys to jump on board. I've got the, uh, the camera the right, right way around today, so hopefully I don't cover the camera as I'm going through the comments. Um, today's topic for today's live stream is, is the rowing machine good for MX fitness, okay, or enduro fitness as well? Um, so we're going to tackle that, um, answer a few questions about the rowing machine. I get, seem to get, hey David, I get a lot of questions about, is this type of training good? Is that type of training good? Is this type of equipment good? Um, so today uh, I'm going to be tackling the rowing machine. Um, also, I'd like to know if there's any specific events. I want to put some videos together for you guys um, that uh, give you some recommendations or tips that you can follow leading into specific race mates that you have. So for those of you that uh, follow me and watch the videos, first of all, thanks for watching my videos and supporting what I do. Um, but help me help you with uh, different types of content. Um, even if you're watching the replay, post up below in the comments any race meets that you've got coming up. I know there's the, hey Dale, I know there's the Grassroots Series. Uh, some of you like Dale, Speedway, you may have events coming up. Um, there's motocross events coming up, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter what level, whether it's club day, whether it's open stuff, whether it's state round, whether it's national level, um, post up, okay? Let me know what, where you guys are riding, where you guys are racing. That way I can tailor the content around specific events as well. So, because um, there's little nuances or nuances, I don't know how you say the word, but little little things that need um, tweaking. Hey, Andrew, uh, little things that need tweaking and testing um, for different types of events. So don't be shy. Post up well, post up uh, below in the comments, even if you're watching the replay, let me, let me know where you're going racing. Um, but to get into today's uh, live stream, as I said, the topic for today is the row is the rowing machine. Hey, Justin, good for uh, motocross fitness. Okay, and before we get into talking about the rowing machine specifically, um, there's when it comes to equipment, equipment is the the tool. Okay, that we use. So there's certain principles of fitness that we need to follow first, and then with those principles of building race fitness, then there's different tools that we can use. Okay, so it's a bit like building a house, right? Just because I've got a hammer and some bricks and a bag of cement doesn't automatically mean, mean that I can build a house. First, you need to have plans and some sort of foundation of what the house is going to look like, what you're working towards, what you're focusing on, what the goal of the, the house is, okay, what it's going to look like. And then after that, you can get bricks, okay? You can get a Makita drill or a Milwaukee drill or go and get a, a Zito cheap cheap drill, right? You can buy different brands of cement. You can buy the, the quick set stuff or you can buy the, the slower set stuff, okay? You can have render over the front. Um, you can use different brands of toolbox. You can use a Hilux ute. You could use a Land Cruiser, or you could have your gear in the back of a high ass van, right? They're all they're all tactics, right? They're all tools that you can use. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the principle and the plan that you're working towards set out first, then it doesn't matter. You can have the best drill and the best bricks and the best whatever. It's not going to matter because you don't know what you're working towards. Okay, you don't know what the the, the underlying principles are. So first of all, in terms of the the rowing machine. Let's take a step back from the equipment first before we get into that. The first thing you need to understand is what, what's the stimulus or what's the goal you're trying to get from your training. So for most of you, if you're doing three or four hour enduro races, you're doing uh, 20 minute half hour motocross events, you're doing like Dale, shorter um, uh, speedway bike events, which could be a couple of minutes at a time, okay, obviously quite high intensity, then you need to look at, okay, what, what principles do I need to be following here? So the first principle that you need to be following is you have to be using interval training, okay? And getting your body comfortable at working at high intensity. So if you take a, even if you take an enduro, I always use motocross as an example. Let's take an enduro track, right? Let's say you're doing a, a three to four hour enduro, like there was on the um, the weekend, there was the round two of the grassroots, the Kosciuszko killer, right? I've never raced there. I haven't even looked at the track, but I know this in advance because it's the same for every track. Every track, there are always parts of the track that are very physically demanding, okay? So if it's an enduro, there could be like a really tough hill climb, a really tough rock garden, a really tough log to get over, okay? A really steep downhill. Where you're really muscling the bike around, you're really throwing the bike around, it's, it's very, it, using a high level of exertion, okay? A high level of effort. But then there's other parts of the track that are, are, are your rest periods, okay? They're parts of the track that when you're fatigued, you look forward to these parts of the track because you're like, oh, I can't wait to get back to that bit to have a bit of a break and rest and recharge before the tougher sections. And so no, no, um, that would have been no different on the weekend, okay, for the, the Kosciuszko killer. 
as I said, I haven't seen any photos, I haven't seen any video footage, but every track is the same, okay? Even for road racing, there's parts of the track that are more physically demanding and part like maybe going into the corners under heavy braking or under heavy acceleration if you're riding a bigger bike. Um, resting parts might be like when you're going down a straight, okay? Or maybe it's like a chicane or S-bends that's really hard for you. So there's always these variations of intensity. If you're doing motocross, there's heaps of braking bumps that might be hard for you, floating through the air over a jump, which might be easy. For you, Dale, um, riding out in Speedway, okay, maybe the corners are the hard bit, which are really intense where you're really fighting the bike, and the straights when the bike's up nice and straight where you can tuck in, and that's the easier part for you, okay? That's the resting period. So depending on the type of riding you do, the intensity is different, but it's always going like this, up and down, okay? So that's the first thing. That's the, the principle we have to follow. So now that we know the principle and how we're going to train or why we're going to train, now we can find out how to implement that, okay, or what pieces of equipment we can use. But you can have the best piece of cardio equipment, right, but it doesn't really matter if you don't apply that principle, okay, of using high-intensity training or using interval training, okay? So what you should be using to implement that is intervals, if you haven't watched my videos before, short, sharp bursts of high-intensity activity, okay? So if we're talking about rowing machines today, instead of rowing for half an hour, do one minute on, one minute off, repeat that, 10, 12, 15, 20 times, okay? And um, and go through that. So the whole workout will be, sorry, the whole workout will be 20 minutes, so about 10 rounds, okay? A minute on, a minute off. Now, the whole goal here is to train the intensity. Okay? You're getting your body to operate at that high intensity like it does when you go and race on the weekend or when you go and ride, whether that's enduro, whether that's speedway, whether that's motocross, whether that's road racing, whether that's trials riding, okay? It doesn't really matter. Um. So now that we know how to train, okay, we know the principle of training, okay, and the stimulus we're trying to get. Now we can pick, now we can do the fun bit and pick different types of equipment to do that. Um, now, as with all things, okay, there's pieces of equipment that are, are better than other pieces of equipment. Um, but what I'm going to give you today is not so much a specific piece of equipment, is I'm going to give you three things to follow when you're choosing a piece of cardio equipment. Now, again, before, I just want to stress this because I can't really stress it enough. The equipment is not the important part. The protocol you use is the important part, okay? The intervals, the high intensity stuff, that's the important part, okay? That's more important than just trying to pick any pieces of equipment because if you just pick any piece of equipment and go and, and you think that, that one's the best and then go and spend an hour on it, that's not going to guarantee you results, okay? The guaranteed results comes from following the right protocol and the right system. So um, any questions, guys? Anything so far that's come up? I'll just check here on uh, what's going on here. On Facebook, if there's any questions at all as I'm going through, post them up, okay? Or anything you're not sure about, anything you need me to clarify, post up in the comments. Um, or if you're enjoying the content, please give me a like um, to let me know that this is actually helpful. So three things you want to look for in a good piece of cardio equipment. First thing, and I've written them down here, that's why I'm looking over. First thing is you want to have a look at the amount of impact that it puts on your body. So what I mean by impact is how much uh, pressure and stress is it putting on your body by pounding into something? So when I say impact, the first things that come to mind for me are running. And the other thing that comes to mind for me is doing like box jumps, okay, or plyometric work. So when you have high impact cardio, okay, and you're doing a lot of work, there's a higher, much higher chance for injury. And the reason there's a higher chance for injury is because there's impact involved. Okay, when you look at the rehab process that a physio uses, the last thing on the scale of, of rehabbing a person with an injury is impact work, okay? All of the other things come before that. Movement, flexibility, movement, strength work. Impact is the last thing because that's what causes the most shock, okay, to the body when we're just pounding our body into the floor or into something like we are with the box jump or like we are with running. So the reason you want to have something that's lower impact is because you're not going to have as many issues long-term with injuries, okay? Um, if you enjoy running and that's what you do, that's great. But overall, my recommendation is don't use high impact activities because that's where the greater risk is for injury. Hey, Adam. And also greater risk for flaring up previous injuries, okay? Um, the, the more we can reduce impact, the less it's gonna flare up old injuries. So if you've, got, you've had an issue with the back or your back or with your shoulders or with your knees or with your ankles, or you've had broken bones before, using high impact activities, okay, for high reps for long periods of time, um, is going to start to flare those up, okay? And you're gonna to start to have more issues long-term rather than having less issues, okay? Then you're just training around pain all the time um, rather than actually seeing improvement on the bike. So again, if you enjoy running, by all means, get out and, and run. Um, if you like it, that's great. 
Um, but if you're just looking for the benefits of your right for, for riding and that's purely why you train, then find something more lower impact. Example of lower impact cardio could be a rowing machine. Okay, it could be, hey James, could be a rowing machine, could be an assault bike, could be an exercise bike, could be, um, if you are gonna run, use an assault runner. If you don't know what they are, look it up. Um, it's a funny looking thing, but that has much less impact than running on concrete or running on the ground and will help with your, um, your stride and your movement. Uh, other things that you can use, you could use like an elliptical machine. Um, trying to think off the top of my head, what other, they're, they're some of the main ones you can use that are much lower impact. You could do swimming even. Swimming is very low impact, right? Um, because of the water, it takes a lot of your body weight away from you. Um, so it's actually takes stress off your joints rather than putting stress on your joints. So you can use, uh, swimming is a, a low impact activity. Second thing that we want to um, we want to go to is that all making sense, guys? Let's see what's going on here. See if there's any uh, any comments coming through. Post up. What do we got? Any questions at all? Everything making sense? Just give me a thumbs up if everything's making sense so far. Awesome, Dale. Sweet. What about the rest of you? All making sense. All right, it's a few likes coming through. The second thing that you wanna have a look at is the resistance. So when you're training with your cardio, you wanna make sure that, you wanna make sure that you can adjust the resistance. The reason that adjusting the resistance is important is because when you go and, when you go and train, you wanna be able to have different variables that you can move around and adjust. And so the reason resistance is important when we're doing our cardio is Cardio needs good cardio, good conditioning, good intervals needs to have a balance of these two things. If we go too light with resistance, so let's say I'm let's say I'm on an exercise bike, and I put the resistance on really easy. Okay, there's no resistance at all. What happens is my body's hardly working. Right, it's like the pedals are just in free flight. My legs might be moving 100 miles an hour, but there's not really any stimulus at all. Like I'm not getting out of breath. My legs are moving 100 miles an hour. I look like I'm doing a whole heap of work. Hey, Tony but really I'm not, okay? That's one side of the spectrum. Complete opposite side is if we crank the resistance up to like a 10 out of 10, or as much as the bike goes, we've got too much resistance. And so what happens then is we can't ride at a high enough intensity. Our cadence on the bike can't be high enough for us to get a really good workout and really good benefits. So what starts to happen is it becomes more of a strength workout. You're really grinding through and pushing and your legs might be burning, but in terms of building cardio and building conditioning, um, it's not too effective because yet you're getting up on the on the pegs or up on the pedals trying to push. You have to go really, really slow because the resistance is too heavy. So then we also don't get an optimal workout. Optimal workout is somewhere in between. It might be like a six or seven or an eight, depending on what type of machine you're using. Okay. Now, so that's great. If we use an exercise bike, we can adjust resistance. We use a rowing machine, we can adjust resistance. Um, we use a other machines, you might be able to use a stepping machine or elliptical machine. If you can adjust the resistance on it to find that sweet spot, that's great. The thing is, when we look at, say, swimming, we can't adjust the resistance of the water, okay? The water is what it is. It's at one resistance. So we can't adjust that. We can't make things harder. We can't make things easier when we need to. It's just you've got the resistance of the water. Um, same thing goes for, uh, what else was I going to? There was another example I had in my mind, and I didn't write it down before, which maybe I should have. But that would be an example of where you don't have adjustable resistance. Okay, you can't increase how hard, how hard it is um, or how easy it is. Maybe even um, same for running as well. Uh, the third thing is you wanna have a consistent environment. So what I mean by consistent environment is when you're doing your cardio and conditioning, you always wanna, hey Brody, you always wanna track to make sure that you're improving, okay? That's one of the main things with training and cardio. You wanna track things to make sure you're improving. Track your intervals, track your workouts, track the results that you're getting from those. So if you're doing a one minute interval on the rower and you're doing that for 10 rounds, record how many meters you got for each round. Because then when you come and retest that in a few weeks time or you do a similar workout, you've got a gauge of where you're at before. Hey, Adam. And then what you can do is set a target for where you need to go. But also it just shows you that you're improving. Now. You can, only, you can only track progress with a consistent environment, right? So if I go and like, if I go and cycle, for example, on an actual cycle bike, okay, not an exercise bike, a cycle bike out on the road, 
And I go and cycle for an hour and there's a whole heap of different paths or trails or roads that I can go down. Is we've got an inconsistent environment. So I can't, there's not, it's very hard for me to be able to track my cycling. If one week I'm doing a half hour, the next week I do an hour, one week I go backwards on the route, next week I go forwards, one week I tackle the big hill, one week I go on the flat. It's just exercise, right? It makes it very hard to be able to track progress. The only thing you're going to be able to track is your heart rate, right? Which is still ineffective because the stimulus you've got from your cycling is different depending on the route that you take. So consistent environment is important. Same as if you go mountain biking, right? Or if you're using even motocross or riding as a gauge, the environment's always changing. And that's one of the hard things about tracking fitness with motocross or enduro is the environment's always different. You can rock up to the same motocross track, okay, three times in one week and it's completely different. One time it's been graded, the next time it's been pissing down with the rain, the next time it's been 40 degrees and it's all wishy-washy sand, right? Um, so it's always different. So you're never comparing apples with apples. So consistent environment, what does that look like? Using stationary equipment if you can. On a rowing machine, you've got a consistent environment. When you put the resistance on a specific resistance, it's going to be the same as the last time you used it. Okay, If you put on an 8 out of 10, it's going to be an 8 out of 10 like it was last time. But also the environment's the same. When you're pulling the handle, okay, like yes, there's little things like maybe the chain's not lubricated, all of that sort of stuff. Okay, Maybe it's got a little bit more dust in the fan. But overall, the variables are very, are very small on the rowing machine, okay? You can get a fairly consistent result on the rowing machine every time you jump on it. In comparison to going for a mountain bike ride where the conditions are always changing, they're always different, okay? One day you got more traction because it's it's maybe a little bit damper. One day you got less chance, traction because it's really dry. Next day you're super slow because it's been pissing you out of the rain. It's not a consistent environment. You can't measure progress. You can't see if you're improving. You don't know where you need to knuckle down and where you don't because there's too many variables. So using things like an, uh, an exercise bike and a rowing machine uh, are great tools because they're consistent. Um, and that's what I really like about um, cardio equipment specifically is it makes it easier to track and measure things, okay, as you're, uh, you're going through your training. And that, at the end of the day, that's what you want, okay? If you're just going to the gym, doing the same stuff and you don't track what you're doing, you don't know if you're improving. If you don't know improving, if you don't, if you don't know that you're, imp you're improving or you can't see improvement, then you're going to be going, shit, am I doing the wrong stuff? And you're going to get shiny object syndrome where you're always onto the next program and doing something different. So there are three things. First of all, make sure it's low impact. Second, make sure that you can control the resistance and make it harder or easier if you need to. And then three, make sure you've got a consistent environment to make sure that you can track progress fairly and equally on a session by session, week by week basis. Um, again, that's why barbell training is also great because you can improve all of those. Barbell training, low impact, great. We can control the resistance. We can put more weights or take weights off and consistent environment, okay? We've got a flat floor. We've got the barbell that weighs the same. We've got the weights that weigh the same. Everything is exactly the same every time. So it makes it much easier to, to track and measure. Um, whereas if you're trying to build strength while riding a, a motocross bike, it's very hard to track that, okay? Um, that's why the gym stuff is easy to see improvement on. Uh, I did have a question come through. If there's any other questions, guys, do not be shy. Post up. Um, and if any of you guys would like some help, I have a couple of spots open for our next intake of riders. Um, you do need to make a commitment to me, though. You need to commit to three one-hour blocks of training each week off the bike. Um, I need you to commit to following a meal plan at least 80% of the week. Um, and I also need you to be coachable as well. In other words, you don't mind being wrong and doing the wrong stuff and approaching your training in a different way. Um, so if that's you, if that sounds like you, uh, then send me a private message and I'll see if I can help. All right, let's get to some questions. Adam, uh, should I change my hand grips or just the normal, uh, should I change my hand grips or just the normal rowing position? Um, so I'm assuming, I'm assuming what you're asking, Adam, maybe just clarify that for me if you're still on the, on the, um, on the live stream, what you're meaning, like I've seen out there, like you can get motocross handlebars for a rowing machine. So are you saying like, Hey, should I be having the same grip width as what I have on the bike? Or should I be doing an underhand grip or some different grip to what's on there? I'm assuming that's what you're asking. Um, if that is what you're asking, um, you don't need to change any of that. Um, you just need to use, Oh, let's, um, flicked around to my calendar for the day. So um, if that is the question that you're asking, I was trying to see what's going on with the comments there. Let's have a look. So 
if that's what you're asking, sorry guys, lost track of where the question was. So if that's what you're asking, I'm assuming that's what you're asking. The whole goal of training is never to replicate what's happening on the bike. Okay, that's not our goal. If you, the only, the best way to replicate what's happening on the bike is to actually go and ride the bike, okay, and spend uh, time out riding. The whole goal of the gym and training is to build a base level of strength and a base level of fitness, okay? We're never trying to replicate what's actually happening on the bike. Um, and that's where I see a lot of riders do go wrong is they're trying to replicate what's happening on, they're trying to, they're trying to look like they're riding the bike in the gym, but that's not our goal of the gym, okay? The goal of the gym is to increase your base level of strength, in, improve your base level of conditioning, and give you a really good base to use for when you go out and ride. Um, we're not trying to get in the exact same position and exact width of the handlebars and get our feet in the exact position that they be on the foot pegs and squeeze our legs in the exact way that we would when we're grabbing onto the tank. And we're not trying to replicate putting your foot out in the corners, okay, um, with with one leg and, and sitting down, okay? We're not trying to replicate all of that stuff. That's, that's the bike stuff, that's skill stuff. What we're trying to do in the gym is just build a base level of strength and build a base level of fitness and use the best ways that we have to be able to do that. Um, the other reason that we don't replicate how we move on the bike is a funny thing happens with your body. So with training, when you do training, if you only use one set of exercises, right? So let's say, um, let's say that we had this specific position on the bike we were struggling with and all we did all year was just do this position in the gym. What would happen when we um, use that position in the gym is that what would happen when we uh, are in the gym, okay, and we're trying to replicate those positions, we don't even get good at them for the first four to six weeks. And the reason only the first four to six weeks that you would start to improve is because what happens is our body adapts to the exercises that we do. So even for um, the guys that I coach and work with um, from the training side, every four weeks, I'm changing their exercises and changing their training. And the reason I do that is because what happens is anytime you do a new program, something that's new for your body that you haven't done before, the first four weeks, you will see the most amount of progress. It will go like this. And you'll be like, this is fucking amazing. I found the next greatest thing. This is awesome to be able to improve my riding. Uh, my fitness is, is going out. Awesome. Great. Okay. Everything's on the, um, on the right path or on the right track. And then what happens after four weeks is that's when the results start to die off. Okay. That's when things start to plateau out. So your progress went like this for four weeks and then it starts to go like this. Okay. And then you're still doing the same work, but it's still staying in that same spot. And the reason that happens is because your body adapts to the train. So then we need to change the stimulus, change the exercises, change what we're focusing on. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Adam, uh, if that was your question. That's it. Awesome, Adam. Sweet. Does that help you, Adam? Does that give you a, um, a clear answer? Hey, Ben. Hey, John. You just give me a thumbs up if that answers your question or if you've got a... Um, a continuation of that question, then you can um, post that. Um, so I do, that's what I see a lot of riders do is I see a lot of riders trying to replicate their riding in the gym. Um, and apart from looking funny and looking weird when you're out there, when you're, you're, you're in the gym, you're also not maximizing what's happening out on the bike as well. Like I've seen, I've seen people like standing on BOSU balls, like trying to, trying to mimic like being off balance when they're on the bike. It's like, that's not the goal of the gym. That if you want to improve your balance, go and stand on your bike, okay? Go and improve your balance on your bike. Um, the goal of the gym is not to do those things. Um, we're not trying to mimic your bike. The only way you mimic your bike is by getting on your bike. What we're doing in the gym is building a great base. That's really what we're focusing on. Um, any other questions, guys? What else we got? Any other questions? Where's everyone going racing? Anyone got any racing coming up? that I can help them with or prepare for, or give them some tips for maybe with uh, fitness, training, nutrition, or any questions on any of the cardio stuff I've gone through so far. What have we got? Or maybe you just enjoyed this video and if you can give it a like, that would be great. Um, because Facebook doesn't show the video to anyone otherwise if people don't engage with the video. So if you could give it a like, that would help out greatly. Uh, so some more people can actually uh, see it. Questions, what questions have we got, guys? What have we got? I'll check here, make sure everything's working A-OK. -okay. Any questions at all? Training, riding, racing? 
Tony, uh, racing in Port Hedland, 37 degrees. Nice and warm. Cool. Do you have a question there or are you just letting me know? It is warm. It's always hard racing in hot weather. Um, done that quite a few times over the years. Especially when you're getting changed at the start of the day. When it's hot and you, you're already hot, you're sweating before you've even... Um, you're hot before you've even put your gear on and then you're putting more layers and layers of clothing on. Um, it's not too fun at all. That was actually, for me, I think when I raced at Coolum in Queensland when we had the Nationals there, that was like 40, 38, 40 degree days that we had. Um, they were cooking. I remember sitting in my trailer after the last race. I think I sat in there for probably about an hour. Um, just took all my clothes. Well, I didn't even get to the point where I took my stuff off. Um, I just sat there and contemplated life for a little bit before I started taking me stuff off. Um, uh, coping with the heat. Okay. Um, so a few things with coping with the heat. First of all, you have to be on your A game with preparation. So as soon as you get dehydrated, you're fucked. That's pretty much it, right? There's no coming back from dehydration without having a rest. So if you're dehydrated before, like halfway through race day, chances of you getting much better by the end of the day without resting are going to be slim to none. Um, you're not going to be anywhere near your best. So first of all, you have to be organized, Tony. You've got to be prepared. Um, and there's a few things you need to be prepared with. First thing is hydration. So getting enough water in, right? Um, a lot of the time though, water, water is a problem. You need to get enough water in 30 to 40 mils per kilo of body weight each day or more. Um, that's at minimum. Uh, getting the water in though is part of the problem. The other, the other problem is keeping the water. Okay, you've got to hold on to the water. And at the end of the day, that's what hydration is. Hydration isn't just drinking a shit ton of water. Hydration is holding your body holding on to water. As soon as your body can't hold on to water, you will dehydrate and you will feel shit. You will be pissing gold. Um, you will get headaches. You will get migraines. You won't be able to focus. You'll feel faint. You'll feel lightheaded. You'll be light on energy. You'll fatigue quicker. You'll have low levels of strength. Your endurance will be out the window. All of those sorts of things. So... The next thing that you need to do is make sure, and usually in hotter climate, so like Port Hedland, especially if you're riding with your gear on, Tony, which you should be, um, you're going to sweat a lot. And so when you sweat, your body excretes salt, okay? Salt is excreted through um, sweating. So you'll notice when you get really sweaty and it starts to dry, you get like this rough feeling. It feels like almost like you've got dirt and sand and shit all over you. A lot of that is salt. So salt helps our body to retain water. When we sweat, we excrete water, um, sorry, and salt. What happens though, is if you are sweating out heaps of sweating heaps and you're losing heaps of salt and you're putting water in, there's nothing there to hold onto the water. So a good start with that is for all the water that you drink, even for just a normal day, Tony, put two and a half grams of salt, uh, preferably sea salt or Himalayan salt, like pink Himalayan salt in your water. Um, for, for, sorry, two and a half grams of salt for every liter of water that you have. Okay, and that, do that for non-racing days. Like if you live in a hot climate, do that on non-racing days as well, not just on racing days. So that will help you with hydration and make sure you've actually got water in you before you ride. Most people rock up to race day dehydrated. Okay, they're not as hydrated as what they could be. Um, the other thing is make sure you've got plenty of carbs in you. So carbohydrates, carbohydrates, okay, hydrates is in the name. Carbohydrates hold water as well. So often what happens on ride day is people will get a combination of things happening, especially like up north. They'll go and ride and they're sweating a lot. So they're sweating a lot and they're losing salt, okay? So they're already dehydrated because they're losing salt and not replacing it. The other thing that happens is you burn through energy through race day, okay? So the amount of glycogen, stored energy that you have is decreased. So now you don't have salt to hold onto water and you don't have any carbs to hold onto water, which is just a disaster waiting to happen. So how do you overcome that? Um, what you do is you... Um, increase the amount of salt that you have in your water, first of all. And then second, increase the amount of carbs that you have in. So carbohydrate load, okay? Use complex carbs before race day and the morning of race day. Use simple carbs before each race and even after each race if you need to as well. Um, the whole goal of hydration is you're going to find it hard on race day because it's really hot, you're sweating a lot, and you're exerting yourself. So you really, all the work is done before. Get the salt in, get the carbs in beforehand. Um, make sure you're getting plenty of water in, okay, all the time. You shouldn't be just be doing this on race day. You should be doing this stuff all the time. Um, and then when you get to race day, it's just about topping up that tank, 
Okay, okay, I've lost a bit of water, top it up, lost a bit of salt, top it up, lost a little bit of carbs, top it up. What most people do is rock up to race day, they start at the bottom, and then their day just goes downhill as they get through the races. Um, I was one of those people when I was younger. People, like, my mum doesn't cope too well with the heat, and people would always say, oh, you're one of those people that doesn't cope well with the heat, oh, you don't deal with the heat, and mum and dad would tell me, oh, you don't deal with the heat. And I never did deal with the heat. I'd come in from races, and I'd spend like an hour there, like a motocross, right? Coming from a motocross race, sit in, the, in, my, in my chair under the gazebo, going, holy fuck, like, what am I doing? I feel like absolute shit, headache, like, no energy, fatigue. And I'd literally sit there until the next race. Now, for a motocross day, that's a pretty long fucking wait, right? But I'd sit there most of the time on those hot days, wait until the next race and go, oh, fuck, I've got to get up for this next race. Not even really wanting to go out there, to be honest. It's just that you're there for racing and that's what you do, right? Um, now, knowing what I know now, what I've learned over the last 10, 11 years, I go and train all the time on 40 degree days. It does not bother me. 40, 41, 42, be 42 degrees and I'll be out there at like one or two o'clock in my garage at home doing my training, right? No airflow, no nothing and perfectly fine. Can train through, lift heavy weights, do all the stuff that I could never do before. Um, and the reason is because of those three things. I focus on those. Get enough salt in, get enough water in, eat properly and get some carbs in. Before I didn't drink enough water, didn't get enough salts in and Probably ate too many carbs, to be honest. Probably had that bit nailed. It's probably more the salt and the water that I didn't nail. Um, and I didn't know how to eat for performance as well. So that's probably um, probably part of the problem. Does that answer your question, Tony? Luke Hughes, Regan Duffy is a beast on a bike. Okay. Um, he is a beast on a bike. I'm not sure if that's a question for me, though, or if that's just a, um, a, a random statement. Um, do you have a question, Luke? Uh, Joe, good to have you here. Best way to stay hydrated is to drink 30 to 40 mils um, per kilo of body weight. Um, make sure you get your salt in and make sure you get your carbs. And I think I probably answered that for you already, Tony. Have you trained with him before? Uh, no, I have not trained with Regan Luke. Uh, hey, Craig. Hey, Brendan. Um, any other questions, guys? Anything else? Anything else at all? Training, riding, racing related questions? Anything that I can help with? What have we got? Any questions at all? Anything at all I can help you with? Uh, yes, he is. We probably raced together. He's a fair bit younger than me. I'm, um, we had two WA guys up in front. We had Kyle Webster win the lights and Regan Duffy win the open, which is pretty cool. Um, have WA on the map. Um, uh, and they rode really well, which is great to see. Um, I probably rode with Regan, but I would have been, so I'm 20, I'm 28 this year. I think he's 18 this year. So it's a 10 year difference. So he would have been on 65s probably. Um, or maybe 50s even, 65s when I was um when I was on 125s. Um, I do remember him hooking around on a 65 though. Um, he would absolutely fly around. I think it was at Wanneroo I remember seeing him. Um, and he would absolutely tear around there, miles ahead of everyone else. Have I raced Manjum up 15,000? Uh, yes, I have. More times than I can count. Um, probably most of those 14 years. I think there was a few years there they didn't, they stopped running it. Um, I think the club used to run it and then Willie Thompson started running it. Um, so I didn't race it those years, but majority of years I got out there and raced. And to be honest, I wasn't really a fan of the track. I know everyone says it's a great track and I had designations there and all the rest of it, but for me it was a... Um, uh, it was never a never a good track. The thing I didn't like about it is the adjustment, like half the track's sand and half the track's hard pack. And I never found, I, I could never get my groove um, adjusting to those two um, in, the, in the same track. It was either like all hard pack and I'd get used to that, or all sand and I'd get used to that, but adjusting between the two for me, um, never really did that well. Maybe got a couple of trophies there, but nothing to brag about. Craig. Open question. My son is 14. 
what specific exercises can we do to improve his on-bike fitness? And I missed the first part. Is the rowing machine good? <laughs> You'll have to go back, Craig, um, and watch the whole video because I'm not going to have a black and white answer for you with the rowing machine. Um, what you have to do um, in terms of specific exercises, he needs to get strong. So being 14, he's probably going through the changes of life at the moment or about to go through them. Um, you can get him started in some weight training. So things like back squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, bent over rows, um, there's some good exercises. Um, he's probably he's at about the age now where he can start getting into some weight training and just building a good base with moving well. Um, my recommendation would be though to get is to get a coach or get someone to help him or a PT at the gym um, to help him learn those movements. Um, often when you start off with with weight training, it's probably the highest chance you have of getting hurt as well um, because you don't know what you're doing. Um, and a lot of people go, oh, yeah, I think I know what I'm doing. It seems self-explanatory. You know, get the bar on and do some squats. But um, I could not recommend getting some guidance at the start enough. Um, I made that mistake for too many years, right? I would just get the barbell and stick it on my back and try and do stuff and then wonder why everything was hurting and I could never do it. So, um, yeah, uh, bell, barbell training, back squats, deadlifts, overhead press, bent over rows are some movements to start with, Craig, for him. Um, he can just, for him being 14, he can just start off once, twice a week and he'll see improvement with those. Um, and then later on, once he's getting good at that and he's consistent with that, um, then you can ramp it up a little bit more, stick a little bit more weight on. Sorry, I keep covering the screen. The other day I was, I set it up today so I could use my proper hand and I'm still using the wrong hand. Cool, I like your history. Awesome, Luke. Uh, any other questions, guys? What else we got? Any other questions at all? Let me see here. Does that help you out, Craig? I'll give you some uh, give you some direction. Awesome, sweet, beautiful. Anything else, guys? Any other questions? Anything else? Training, riding, racing. Fitness, anything I've gone through today on that call that um, I can um, double check for you, confirm for you? Anything at all? What do we got? Or maybe you just like uh, listening and never ask any questions. Um, if it's been helpful today, I know there's some new, new, new guys on here uh, watching the video, which is great. If you could just give it a like for me, give it a thumbs up. Helps Facebook to show it to more writers. Um, if people don't engage with the videos, Facebook doesn't want to show it to anyone. Um, so if you can, uh, you can do that. It helps out uh, great, greatly. Uh, foods before race day. Um, so foods before race day that you want to have. Um, you want to be having. Well, it's a it's a very open question, but because there's there's a few things that need to happen. But the main thing that needs to happen is you need to increase your complex carbs. So things like sweet potatoes, potatoes, brown rice, quinoa, those types of foods need to be increased four hours before your first ride and also the night before race day. Um, you also need to uh, make sure that you have proteins, carbs, and fats in there as well. Um, Craig, I did a video on that uh, last, I think it was last Friday. So if you go on my page, um, there's a video there that will run you through um, the full video on how to eat before race day. All right. That looks like it's it for today. Um, there's no other questions. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed today's call. Um, as I said, any of you guys need um, some help with your training, uh, feel free to reach out and send me a private message. Otherwise, I'll chat to you guys soon. See ya.